Okay, thanks, Juan. Thanks for uh, for joining. Um, we'll kick it off our uh, our capture space with our special guest today, Tom Walton Pocock. We'll uh, let him introduce himself in a second. But thanks very much for joining, Tom. Um, very quick by background on uh, on capture. Uh, we are a DeFi asset management platform out there to decentralize the asset management industry. We um, we launched and minted an NFT collection, FCK, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and we're very excited with our uh, our growing community and to be hosting these spaces um, uh, probably weekly with uh, varying top guests uh, every week. My own background is on the hedge fund side, so I was in TradFi for many years, running a fund and working for a number of other funds before going fully Web three a couple of years ago. Um, Tom and I actually loosely overlapped in TradFi and uh, became friends a couple of years as he was uh, was building his first business. Um, and uh, with that, I'd, I'd love to um, hand over the mic to Tom. He's uh, doing some fantastic things at uh, Geometry. And maybe, Tom, you can start a little bit with your own background uh, and maybe what you did with your, uh, your first um, uh, crypto business. Of course. Cool. Thanks, King. Um, so, yeah, my background going right way back was... Um, I did uh, did maths undergrad and postgraduate university and uh, studied a I guess a lot of algebra that ended up being very useful to me but um, quite unexpectedly uh, later on um, I had a sort of glancing blow with with uh, classical music and then uh, and then was in uh, as King says finance for a few years um, then built a company called Aztec Network uh, which is um, a kind of privacy first layer two uh, on Ethereum probably best known. Um, for Zach Williamson and Ariel Gabazon's uh, invention of, of Plonk, uh, which happened in around about 2019, and has uh, sped a lot of the development of uh, scaling in a very secure way on, on Ethereum, uh, and also um, enabling cheap privacy at the same time. Uh, I left there start of last year, around about March, and founded uh, this new, very experimental uh, research house our focus is on zero knowledge proofs, uh, different types of, of new cryptography that can do very interesting things right the way from uh, the layer one, right the way up um, to the, the application layer. And our entire focus is sort of finding interesting applications of this this new science of zero knowledge proofs and other other areas of deep maths. So, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm probably just about at the opposite end, at least optically, of, of the spectrum from uh, uh, being an NFT expert, uh, but we're doing some, I think, interesting thinking around uh, how cryptography and, and NFTs might might at some point interact. I'm happy to go into that further on the call. Yeah, great, um, great to great to hear, Tom. And maybe for some of us, maybe a thirty seconds introduction on zero knowledge uh, and and sort of what it is, what the applications are, and from there on, it'd be great to hear a bit more what you're doing uh, on the NFT side with your specific angle on uh, cryptography. Sure. So, um, I, th- I mean, the story of zero knowledge kind of surprisingly goes back to the 80s. And there was this kind of, uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of the thing called the four color theorem. Um, but there was a very famous uh, statement that people kind of knew you could take any uh, map of any arrangement of countries, doesn't matter which arrangement of countries, doesn't matter how complex the map is. And there was this sort of this sense that we, could, we definitely think we can always color such a map in four colors and it was just never proven and in the uh, late 20th century sort of 1890s uh, someone came up with a proof you could do it with five colors for any map but never that you could do it for four colors and then in the 70s it did get it got proven by some uh, scandinavian uh, mathematicians but they had to resort to using mainframe computers and boiling down the various arrangements of different maps into thousands of different combinations. And this was maybe one example of a wider class of problems that seemed to require proofs that were, to put it in today's Web3 terms, not very scalable, right? So you had these mathematicians who kind of just could not check all of this, these proofs, these enormous proofs, uh, or they would spend you know, half their careers checking them. It just was ridiculous. And so the question was, do we actually know that this is correct? And this should sound to everyone, I guess, like an echo of the problem of ch- checking lots of transactions, right, in, in Web3. Uh, how do I know that millions of transactions are correct when what I really want is a decentralized network that can kind of know they're correct or check that they're correct in some short or succinct way without literally having to go through every single transaction? So uh, it was some MIT professors in the 80s um, 
who initially came up with this idea of a zero knowledge proof where basically i as a prover can create doing a lot of work i can i can uh, go through let's say a load of transactions in the case of ethereum although ethereum wasn't invented at that point or i can go through all of these arrangements of um configurations of maps which was the problem in the 1980s and i can produce this really succinct fossil of information this tiny nugget of information that will prove to you that i definitely found an argument that all maps are four colorable or that or that some specific finite set of maps is four colorable whatever the argument is and you can be convinced of this fact with absolute certainty by only checking a tiny amount of information and doing a very small amount of work now the trade off is i as the person trying to convince you of this fact i need to do a huge amount of work compared with the act of actually running the proof right or or of showing that i've got these four colors so you can see anyway how this uh the, the what we now call the kind of the zero knowledge or succinct proof uh, discipline uh, actually started with a scaling problem and then in maybe fast forward to 2014 zuko and the team at uh Zcash or Zcash as I say as as a Brit um uh, they used it originally for privacy right because actually privacy and and scaling are two sides of the same coin so um the very thing that I need to do to scale ethereum or a blockchain is to prove to you that all the transactions have resulted in a correct version of the state of the network whilst only giving you a small amount of information well that's exactly the same thing that I need to make a private transaction what i'm looking to do is drop out some information i don't want you to know and give you a proof that whatever transaction i did is correct and you can check the logic is correct but you don't have all the information to hand so you can see that actually privacy and scaling when you first look at them you think god oh, these are completely different problems but actually they kind of boil down to the same problem uh, and that's why zero knowledge proofs are so magical because they allow you to prove statements uh, without leaking all of the information and this has massive implications for scalability as well um i think the final thing i'll end with here on the zero knowledge side of things is people are always looking for you know what a concrete example of a zero knowledge or a succinct proof and one thing that i've seen around going around the internet it's not my um analogy but and you probably a lot of you have seen it but this idea that where where's waldo or where's wally again we say where's wally in the uk and we we always have to be different um and you know supposing i want to claim to you that i know where waldo is uh in in this in this image a kind of a cheap way i can give you a succinct proof is i take a large piece of cloth i drill a hole in the middle of the cloth and i pass it back up to wherever waldo is in the picture that is a succinct somewhat zero knowledge proof because you can now very quickly and cheaply check it took me a lot of work to you know get the cloth and cut the hole etc um but i was able to prove to you that i know where waldo is and if i cut the hole in just the right shape i can do it in a way that doesn't leak any of the information about where in the image i have found waldo so there's maybe a nice concrete example of a zero knowledge proof and we're using weirdly very both ancient and new mathematics to make these proofs and to make ethereum scale and fast great that is that is super interesting and i'm sure a lot of us have heard the term come by but never really fully realized what it was but um certainly your point that um uh, scaling and, and and privacy are or privacy <laughs> are really part of the same coin um probably uh, very interesting to hear uh clearly what, there's tons of stuff happening in nfts uh and um these nfts you sort as sort of simple pictures are now getting more and more utility um any any observations on where you think this uh applies to nfts or anything you you're you're um you're looking at would be would be interesting to hear because I can imagine that's sort of the next the next layer i can imagine defi is a massive application um area for 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 zero knowledge but um certainly within the nft space uh, because it's still so young so many things are happening there must be a ton this is true i mean so yes you can oh, you can obviously fairly trivially see that um zk proofs for their privacy properties will have huge applications for defi to where we're sort of sending money to one another something and then uh, and then also uh, succinct proofs for very complex financial systems so if you imagine if we're going to have some some really complex um successor to the banking system where i'm taking capital from something like mika dao whatever putting into arve on bound it to compound etc 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 we could like we could create these really long chains very like um with the kind of the overnight deposit system that we had in the banking sector and repo markets and things that of course blow ups all the time we could end up with exactly or or maybe even much more complex uh, networks of 
financial interdependencies that could produce like the next financial crisis. So, um, so succinct proofs might also have a great use in allowing Ethereum to very quickly check some monumentally complex analysis on uh, is this thing financially stable or not. So they might have an application there. Um, but yeah, as far as NFT is concerned, so um, I, I guess I, I've been a little bit of an outside observer um, to what's happened with NFTs. I've been, I will say, a kind of a mild skeptic um, of um, whether these are true, whether we are building true cultural properties or whether actually this has been a kind of money first, culture second uh, type situation. I'm, I'm not going to opine strongly on that, but I think, I think to me, I, I've never quite uh, reconciled what's gone on with the NFT boom, but I do think that it's been a very useful useful uh, cargo cult. So it's enshrined a data standard that is going to be a sort of carrying really useful high utility assets into the future. And the question is, well, how do... And by the way, it's not, it's not to say that there are not pieces of NFT art that will long run be valuable or sought after or enjoyed. That's not... It's not to say that at all. But it's just to say that I see the punchline as <clears throat> essentially the class of all... Uh, usable, rentable utility assets uh, in 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 metaverse settings, and then I say the question is then, well, how do we get there? So one area, one one way I could have utility assets is we could go into Zuckerberg's world, and uh, that world consists of I don't know offices, houses, other assets we can use. You know, I mean the classic one they always talk about the swords, shields, whatever. Um, in in games, um, <clears throat> trouble with those traveling at the moment as kind of good defensible capital assets um, is that they are fundamentally mutable in their properties. They don't, their properties are not kind of uh, protected by any decentralized authority. And so you know, one very interesting infrastructure project we can do uh, is try to work at how we can use succinct proofs to, for example, allow an NFT to commit to the mesh or the shape or the physical properties of a utility asset. And once we get to some future world where rendering engines are essentially light clients for Ethereum, so in other words, instead of just kind of staring at 0x, whatever, whatever, or some numbers on a screen, um, our rendering engine is having to appeal back to Ethereum uh, to kind of check its state to make sure that it's rendering what the user is seeing accurately and the way that assets are interacting and behaving. Um, that's going to be a real advance because then your assets, as long as you trust your rendering engine is a good open source client of Ethereum, uh, then your asset cannot now be mutated. You are um, your your uh, rendering engine is requesting proofs of, let's say, your NFT of your house, and it's rendering it according to the structures, the data structures that we're committed to, and it starts to take on the shape of a real capital asset of value that can potentially pass between uh, different views of, of, of metaverse or virtual environments. Um, and so that's one area of research that I'm particularly interested in, um, because I think it's where, again, cryptography infrastructure meets an actual um, problem of kind of defending uh, utility assets. And I think I still feel that is probably the punchline um, for what Ethereum long run is going to support. Because one of the key things of the metaverse and, and NFTs, in a way, is uh, it's interoperability, right? That's, that's one big theme that people are talking about. So what you're saying sort of described seems to link into that, where you need cryptography to be able to have this interoperability. Is, is, is that right? Or is that a different angle? So the cryptography in this instance is, is more about, I can't possibly fit all the... Got, so... A, the whole layer two game is actually doing is quietly do and but this is relevant because the the, the, the same problem accords to any NFT you kind of care to print. The the layer two game is, is solving two problems. One is um, we can't check transactions fast enough and keep the network decentralized, and the other is the data to which those transactions resolve. So if you've got you've done a million transactions, let's say on some protocol. And this left you with a balance of one and a half thousand dollars, um, or whatever it is. Like, knowing that, that that is the correct uh, version of state, that requires um, what we call data availability. I need I need the people checking the network, or some of the participants checking the network, to sort of cough up the data that actually represents the current state of Ethereum or whatever your favorite blockchain is. Okay, with NFTs, you've got the same problem. If you want to encode a huge amount of information. Um, so these NFTs will probably live on layer twos, I don't know, but they'll, they'll need a data availability solution that says something like, 
how can you prove to me that from this tiny little piece of data, which is all you could really afford to, to embed inside your NFT, how can you prove to me that it takes the shape that your rendering engine is trying to claim? Um, so the, 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 the use of a zero-knowledge proof here is for its succinctness property. It's the same thing as scaling Ethereum, or it's the same thing as um, checking that lots of maps uh, are all four colorable, for example, in the original uh, example I gave. It's basically checking, does the, uh, what I want to do is encode a huge amount of data that, that is like a, it's like a mesh of the asset, it, it, or it might describe its physical properties, how heavy is it, how, what's its mass, whatever. Um, and all that data you just, you, you probably can't fit sort of naked into the, into the, into the metadata of the, of the NFT. And so you probably actually have to instead offer up a succinct version of that data. So you know that's what the NFT represents. It is an, an asset of this shape, consumes this much space, interacts with other objects in the following way. And then you would you were basically using ZKPs to prove what that data actually resolves to. So that when your rendering engine comes along and wants to reflect this asset in the metaverse, it actually knows what to reflect and it knows that it provably resolves to the little succinct amount of data that the NFT actually carries. I don't know whether that makes sense. Makes total sense. Appreciate it. That's super interesting. And I, I, again, given the increasing utility of NFTs, uh, certainly within the metaverse, that, that, that must be a real problem to solve. Um, let me just reset the room for a second here because we had more people join. So we're here in the, uh, the capture space where we're a DeFi as a magic platform and we have with us Tom walton Fuckock who was uh, previously founder and um, CEO of uh, Aztec, uh, a zero knowledge protocol, um, and is currently founder of Geometry, which is building and investing in Web3. Um, and just talking about how zero knowledge uh, and infrastructure around it could really help the NFT space. Um, probably worth it taking a step back and maybe going into some of the um, trends you see in Web3. You mentioned L2s a couple of times. Maybe a good starting point is your your view on um, on Ethereum going forward from here and uh, the role of L2s in this because that seems to be a big a big sort of theme overall. People like to understand a little bit better, and, and you're very well positioned to probably help us understand a little bit better. Sure, I mean I think the the kind of quite short answer to where Ethereum is going is you know the first thing it offered up was this sort of quite quite slow or, or sort of um, uh, resource constrained. Uh, general decentralized computer, basically. And um, obviously it doesn't scale particularly well, which is why you've got all these layer twos. Um, and I, I guess people are familiar with two ways of scaling Ethereum. One is what we call optimistic roll-ups, where you use, people say economic games, I don't think this describes it very well, but basically or it's, it's basically sort of fingers crossed. And if the transactions are true, we'll kind of, we'll kind of accept that a whole load of these transactions are true. We just We'll just rely on the community to check them. And if there's something fraudulent in here, pr presumably someone some, somewhere will be well incentivized to come in and check the transactions actually aren't true and, and show where the fraud is, and then we'll receive some reward for doing so, basically. And then there's the other way, which is ZK proofs, which basically requires a lot more machinery, a lot more sort of, sort of computing power, essentially. Um, but uh, it, it it means that when the transaction goes on, it is correct at the point of acceptance by Ethereum. Um, so what's Ethereum going to do? Well, th th for what it's actually now being, what's being asked of it in the long run is no longer to check the direct transactions going on through the network, because I think we're all now assuming that this is going to be done by layer twos. So the slightly interesting thing about the EVM is, as in the EVM, at layer one, uh, it's kind of it's it's lifetime as a general computer is possibly going to come under question because all it's actually being used for now is something a bit more complicated than what Bitcoin does, which is just check that rollups are correct. It's just checking these little proofs. They come they come from these rollups that say once every block or once every two blocks or something. So. Um, Let's say Starknet comes comes with a, a proof that all its you know, millions of transactions are correct, and Ethereum's only job is to do two things: first of all, check the ZKP, and second of all, say this is the record of economic events, and there is no other. So it's kind of it's it's got it's got an attestational evangelical role to say this is the version of the blockchain uh, as it, as it is, and to check the internal consistency of those transactions. In other words, but it's basically checking the logic, but it's doing through so through ZKP. Its other job is also likely to be 
they, they, they talk about some data sharding. So this this idea that um, like it's kind of a bit ridiculous for, for kind of everyone to store all the data about Ethereum state, and so there will be some uh, balkanization, some division over um, how data, the data that actually says how much of an asset do you own, how much of an asset do I own, how that's stored. Basically reducing down that guarantee somewhat by, by what's known as, as, as sharding. And then I think longer, longer term, even the layer twos are going to question, can we actually afford to use Ethereum? You know, when we're all running kind of smaller bits of code that we want to be validated, they, it might not be carrying a huge amount of value at that point. Then we're going to need lower and lower levels of data guarantees because it might be that I don't want to spend $5 a year safeguarding some assets which are only worth $3 for example. And so we're probably going to have to have more complex economics to deal with people who want to validate some code. But fundamentally, if the, if the state gets a bit lost, if the information gets a bit lost, we kind of don't care. And I think that's really how Ethereum is kind of is, 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 is going to scale. And the, the kind of maybe the interesting observation here is, it feels like a real missed opportunity for Bitcoin. So I, I won't say I'm a particular maximalist. I'm, you know, do a lot of what I do on Ethereum just because it's there. And it's where a lot of people are. Um, and where a lot of interesting projects are. But it does feel like a missed business case for Bitcoin because Bitcoin, you know, I think everyone is sort of fundamentally aware in maybe even in a hazy way, it's kind of missing this, where's the exogenous cash flow that's going to pay its security fee in the long run? Um, obviously, it's a, probably a while off that problem, but it's coming. And Ethereum gets to be this nice beneficiary of all of this transaction volume that's happening on these lower layers. It doesn't scale with the number of transactions, but it's get it's always going to get a cut of the transaction fees that are being paid to these layer two networks, basically. Um, and it does so because it's the it's the best layer that says this is the true record of economic events, and and we always need that. We always need validation. We always need someone. We need we want the strongest record of um, economic att attestation to tell us this is definitely the true record of 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 your assets. <clears throat> now, Bitcoin actually arguably could do that slightly better because it's that little bit more decentralized and it's got more actually quote unquote validated capital available to it. Um, and it does feel that Bitcoin has potentially missed an opportunity to get this free cash flow and it could have done so for the cost of just validating some layer twos. So uh, that's kind of maybe a, a sort of anecdotal um, side comment um, and it's maybe a bit of a shame for the, for the Bitcoin community. No, that's very interesting. Well, it's, it's not, I mean, in theory, it, it, it... It could do that. People could start. Do you think people could start trying to develop a layer two on on the Bitcoin network? <clears throat> there's a there's one trouble, which is that <clears throat> I think, from what I understand, I, I won't say I understand the Bitcoin as psychology particularly well. Um, I, that's not, but that's not a kind of a subtle criticism. I just I'm I'm not deeply embedded in, in the community. Um, <clears throat> but my understanding is that they're 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 very worried constantly about potentially contaminating the pure asset that they've built and therefore <clears throat> doing something like putting a stock verifier or a snark verifier or something that can check layer twos and therefore be a recipient of these additional fees which are going to be needed in the long run would somehow contaminate the asset that it would be a sort of less perfect you know i always want to reach the most canonical version of my blockchain if i'm adding in this machinery it's, it's somehow less pure and I, I wonder whether that might be part of what inhibits, what kind of stops Bitcoin from being able to take advantage of the, the layer two business model. Yeah. Yeah, you, 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 you do lose that full decentralization, right? Where it's yeah. still the same algorithm that runs. So it needs an application on it. So. Um, and, and maybe maybe back to L2s and Ethereum, right? So you were saying a little bit that <laughs> economics don't always work because there is a fee to Ethereum. There is um, there's pretty thin fees itself for small transactions. It doesn't work. Where do you think this is going then? Because clearly there's been a lot of momentum in different layer twos. Um, what what is your your view on on how to make it resolve itself? So, I certainly there's there are various ways you can charge fees on a on a layer two. So, and there are various, can be various recipients of the money. So, first one is the validator capital. So, this is the kind of the people staking, staking the money into the system. Uh, by the way, the cheapest way that any layer two could do this is to use ETH rather than rather than a, a native token, um, because that's going to get your kind of your lowest capital cost. It's a little bit like in the FX markets; it's much cheaper to borrow in dollars for the same credit risk than it is in some really sort of dodgy currency. Um, so, uh, in a similar way. 
ETH would probably be the best stake for a lot of these a lot of these folks, but of course then you don't get your native token. But anyway, there'll be big value extraction from the validators because they're 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 providing a real service of kind of basically um, censorship resistance and all this kind of stuff. Um, then you've got uh, what I described before, the prover work. So this is all the stuff to actually put the transactions together and show to Ethereum that they're true. So this is like building the argument for the four color theorem. Uh, I want to build this very, very small proof. And some, somehow in this sort of very rough sense, the, the, the smaller and more succinct the, the, the proof is to, to check, the more work that the network, the layer two network has to do to create this proof. Okay, so there is, there's always a trade-off. And so all of that work, that's a lot of computing power required. Um, to give you an idea, going from kind of raw code to building the zero knowledge proof adds between a million and a billion factor very, very crudely onto the cost of actually executing the transaction. So it's a huge wow. blowout. And so probably a lot of value is going to go, in my view, to ZPU, ZKPU, I don't know what, you know what we call these things, but sort of zero knowledge cryptography provers, a bit like GPUs. And I suspect they'll end up on all our phones and all our devices. <clears throat> and probably there'll be huge farms of them at AWS and whatever else. Um, and lots of value will go there. I think. Um, and the reason you can speed up these proofs is because weirdly, maybe, I don't know whether it attests to, to a lack of creativity in cryptographers or whether it's just there is some natural law of the universe that says that this must be true, but all zero knowledge proofs basically boil down to one or two kind of types of basic computation that just get repeated over and over and over and over and over again, which means that you can actually speed this stuff up quite effectively using dedicated hardware. Um, so quite a lot of money will probably go there and to the prover services and also to data availability. So this is, again, it's just think of it like storage. It's like paying for your, you know, for your, for your iCloud photos or whatever, wherever you do your backups. Basically, that data availability layer will accumulate some value. So the only, the only question is really whether value accumulates at the point of execution because these zero-knowledge proofs, I can do this really clever thing called recursion. I take a zero-knowledge, so, so for example, I take, let's say, a thousand transactions and I bundle them up into a proof, and then I take a thousand of those proofs, and then I bundle them up into another proof, and now I've got a million transactions aggregated together, and I can sort of just keep on going. So I can limitlessly take down my actual gas cost, aside from the data availability and all those other costs I talked about, but the actual cost of validation, I can take down to near zero. Now, in practice, that won't happen because I need lots and lots of users and lots of traffic coming through my layer two, but, um, but yeah, so that's probably the only area where the, the business model is a bit questionable. But for the other services around the layer two, there are very clear, quite classical business models around around those networks. Gotcha. Very interesting, uh, Tom. And just a quick reset of the room. We're obviously talking with Tom Walton of uh, Geometry, uh, which invests and uh, and builds a Web3 infrastructure. Um, also, I wanted to make sure that the room is obviously a space that's so open for anyone who wants to uh, ask Tom a question directly. Feel free to raise your hand and um, uh, get on stage. Uh, feel very free to. Um, and uh, in the meantime, we'll, we'll just keep chatting. Um, so, uh, Tom, maybe also worth uh, taking a step back and, and you, you see clearly uh, the many um, themes within Web3, whether it's from NFTs to infrastructure to different layers. Um, I'm not sure with anything on the metaverse you're doing. Any any trends uh, that you think are worth highlighting that are interesting to um, to follow? Because I'm sure you're at sort of cutting edge of early innovation. Um, we're clearly seeing a lot just happening in general within the NFT space, within DeFi, yeah. within what's happening now, metaverse. Uh, very curious whether you um, there's any particular trends you you you, you wish to share with uh, with us. So I so well so. Metaverse, actually, here, here's a clear trend. Uh, my office is in the metaverse, as in it is literally in the metaverse. So, um, uh, and, and I, but I kind of, this is where I kind of want to see NFTs go, is I want to see utility driving driving value rather than, than, than the other way around, rather than value driving finding utility. Do you, do you remember there was that, um, I think the chant from, from 2017 was, I'm, I'm trying to find a use for my coin. Was the sort of the, was the sort of the general? If you ever, ever asked anyone building a project, generally they got a coin out the door and then they've gotten to find a use for it. So, um, so I, I definitely want to see um, utility-led uh, valuations on, on on NFTs. And I think one way that we're going to do this is just by spending more time actually in 
virtual metaverse environments. And, and we've already started doing this now. I, I would rather not do it in quite the, the sort of the centralized conditions that we're doing it. But um, geometry is, as I explained sort of uh, earlier on the call, we, we do uh, research into zero knowledge proofs. This means we spend a lot of time reviewing kind of new cryptography papers, maths papers that are going to have some influence on uh, on the progress of uh, blockchain technologies. And so we literally need to put 12 people in eight different countries into a room with one another. And so we made quite an early decision that everyone who joins Geometry, uh, part of their starter pack is they get a they get a headset, and uh, this is the the uh, Oculus Two. I think they've renamed it the Quest something or other. And um, we use uh, Horizon Meta. Now, I have my personal reservations about this because they are presumably able to stream every little movement that each of our heads makes. Uh, probably they know when we sort of, you know fell down the stairs when we were five years old and like, our history of trauma and whatever else. Um, so the de- the non decentralized aspect of this does worry me, and I think actually it's going to, if we worried about privacy in the old web, well we're going to worry about it in the new web, and I think a decentralized private first environment is going to be critical to making the metaverse somewhere that's tolerable to live in. Uh, but we do all our le- lectures in there, so you can stand up at a blackboard, uh, you can. You can write very legibly on the blackboard, which has been a huge UX innovation just in the last six months. Uh, and yes, and we're, we're, I guess, getting accustomed to, it's like when the, the early smartphones came out, to spending more and more of our waking hours uh, in metaverse environments. I mean, I, they still need to deal with things like eye strain and the fact that the, the thing still weighs a ton uh, on, on, on your head. But uh, but basically, I, I think that is actually what is going to create the next sort of wave of valuable NFTs or the NFT carrying assets of kind of measurable capital value. Um, and so, yeah, we're already kind of underway. So maybe that's a sort of a, maybe that's a, a trend that we're, we're at least an early part of. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. That, that's a huge improvement over, over Zoom or uh, Google Meets. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's for, and, and anything else you're seeing sort of within say, uh, infrastructure builds or anything around it anything on the, on the DeFi side because obviously DeFi has been a little bit of a stepchild the last uh, six months or so any particular areas of, of focus DeFi has gone very quiet I think I think like largely on the cre- I, so I should say Aztec was originally a credit protocol was trying to be a credit protocol um, and that was before some um, some breakthroughs in cryptography that we sort of changed changed business model but um, yeah credit's gone very quiet I think largely because I think maybe one reason that uh, credit protocols haven't really matured is because the only native borrowers on chain would be DAOs. And until this point, they've all been so overflowing with treasury, they just don't have any need to borrow. And so you had these potential candidates to lend against, and they didn't need any money. Um, so I guess what uh, what I'm sort of hoping to see, but I, have to, I confess I haven't yet, is starting to see lending against slightly more interesting primitives it might be on chain collateral uh but it might also be um like sort of you know different types of primitives like streams or whatever we, we i think we might see those quite soon and probably that's the way that we will graduate our, ourselves into a more mature credit market and the reason that's very interesting is because probably that is the long-term replacement capital you know as the assets for things like the wholesale uh you know DeFi protocols, so I would say that those are Maker, Aave, and Compound. Um, <clears throat> we haven't seen it, but I'm kind of expecting it very soon. Is maybe um, maybe a good way to to, to put it. Well, it's very interesting. No, I, I, clearly, if, if you think about DeFi disrupting the traditional financial system, the, the, the most basic form is sort of lending, borrowing, and it happened, as you say, only on on uh, on crypto. Um, so that in itself, arguably, you can argue that it doesn't add a ton of value to sort of society. There's certainly some some use cases of it, but once you can expand that into different asset classes. Um, the the opportunity is, is, is massive. Um, so yeah, exactly. And I think, and also, also, we would expect to, I guess, to see lending markets for 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 a lot of NFT assets for things like um, everything from digital fashion to utility assets to whatever. I mean, I I just would be interested to ask the room, has the room seen the beginnings of a of a lending market? And I say not lending against NFTs, but lend actually leasing NFTs. I, I don't know. I, I've seen, I think one company looking to, to build this, but uh, 
I would expect this to be part of a of a DeFi trend pretty soon. And the really nice thing about that is once you've then got a measurable value for the asset, you can probably then back out a price from that asset without it having liquidity. So again, maybe maybe that's where future NFT liquidity comes from. This is not from, <coughs> excuse me, not directly from floor, pl- floor prices or trading markets, but um, from the valuations they're achieving in their rental value rather than their kind of tradable value. It's very interesting. I think because I think also in general, there's more um, similarities between real estate and NFTs than you think. Just the way the liquidity works, liquidity is very delayed, just like in real estate. But if you think about it, if you own a valuable property, it doesn't have to be valuable, but you want to get some money out without selling it or right. knowing the market price, it's one way to get leverage on it. And the bank will tell you how much they want to lend against it, right? So For sure. I think, yeah, absolutely right. That could be a massive opportunity. Um, and uh, um, yeah, I think I think we've seen some of that. There was this uh, very structured trade where someone borrowed a couple of apes just before the ape coin drop and made a shit ton of money on it. So there's clearly already some structures going on, um, but right. they're probably very, very OTC sort of borrowing lending. Um, but to be able to, I guess, make it more structural is, is, is clear a huge opportunity set. Hmm. Um, yep. Can I ask a question, uh, Tom? Um, my, my name is Sandra, by the way, I do strategy for capture. Um, how, how do you view uh, under collateralized lending uh, in DeFi, uh, for example, Maple? So I I love the idea of it. The, the great difficulty with under collateralized lending is that the, the forms don't typically match particularly well. And what I mean by that is, um, the, the, the core the core me- method of ownership on blockchains is bearer assets. I just I, I own the thing. I literally have the thing. It's like a chattel. It's like a it's like maybe how we used to hold bonds, maybe a hundred years ago or more. And I can say this by the way because I'm I'm personally scarred by the difficulty of trying to <laughs> do a business in this particular area. So maybe I'm still carrying more traumas than the average than the average um, person, but. Uh, the difficulty of turning a contractual asset, an off-chain contractual asset, whose at, whose value is actually guarded by some legal system somewhere where the asset got issued, and a bearer asset, which I just hold because it's in my my it's on it's attached to my address, um, is an incredibly difficult problem. It's a highly centralized problem. It basically means that most of your business, in the long run, is you're basically a loan agent which is just this person who services low. I don't mean just, but uh, it, having claims on off-chain companies or off-chain people is quite a bitty business. And so I guess for sort of under-collateralized lending, I'm sort of looking for other on-chain sources, very like classical markets, of either information, streams, or other kinds of maybe semi-liquid assets, is where I would first expect to see the really long-term tenable major credit protocols right so so that they're, they're actually saying we're going to stick with the ecosystem of assets to which we have access and over time those will become more financially sophisticated and we're not going to bother with so sort of trying to bridge on-chain and off-chain assets in this really messy way and we're going to instead embrace the hard logic of the smart contract that's pr- if i was trying to build a credit protocol now that's what i would be focusing on and my my slight concern for those sorts of companies is that they will be shackled to bridging 50 different legal systems into, and turning them into ERC-20 tokens or whatever they're doing um, for a long time. And it's a huge amount of work uh, to build that bridge. And over time, let's, okay, let's really put on the goggles and say, we managed to solve all the problems that make DAOs a bit rubbish at the moment. So things like actually having centralized actors that can be massively punished in a way that is almost as damaging as being chucked in prison if you're a director who goes AWOL at a company, for example. If I can build slashing conditions on chain that make that really punishing and I can therefore ensure good behavior for the people who are running DAOs, I then have DAOs that are capable of innovation, capable of of generating non-trivial streams of income and cash, I can lend against those streams. I can lend against those revenue lines. I can rent, lend against their businesses. I can help them sort of factorize a load of assets they couldn't before. So in other words, if the DAO becomes a, a real um, sort of replacement to companies, by the way, there are some benefits that will drop out of the bottom of this. One thing is lending against a DAO is, in the long run is going to be far less risky than lending against, for example, a company. 
because for the company, I need to know a whole load of stuff about the legal structure where the company's incorporated, and it's really messy and complicated. And the DAO is just is in this universal jurisdiction, and I know the basic p- code bases that can never have claims against those DAOs. And so, long run, what I hope we get to is a point where someone is somewhere is starting a is, is launching a startup, and they say, "I could start a company, but wow, the capital markets for companies are just so expensive. I have to launch a DAO." It's it is cheaper, and be- it's cheaper because the risk of lending to DAOs is strictly less than it is lending against companies. The recovery times aren't eighteen months going through the courts. I get my recovery immediately, one transaction, one block done. Uh, so that's kind of where I where I hope uh, that we will see these capital markets go, rather than trying to bridge to off chain assets, which I think is is a huge amount of work, and you end up get, getting drawn into this kind of this legal mess of trying to bridge. Uh, bearer and and uh, contractual assets. Thanks, Tom. That's super interesting, and again, links almost to the previous point of uh, of, of where DeFi is going. Sorry, Sunder, you want to say something else? Oh no, no. I just wanted to thank you. That that was a great explanation. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Thanks and in the meantime, we have an, another speaker join the stage. Um, Chaos. Eve, feel free to uh, to grab the mic, or unmute yourself and ask Tom a question. There we go. Hi, Tom. Um, so what you're describing is uh, in layer two in Ethereum. Ethereum is kind of becoming this modular blockchain, right? You have all this this logic being built on top of uh, Ethereum in the form of layer twos. And what you kind of have with all these layer twos is you kind of get a fragmentation or a kind of diaspora of all the logic that was previously on Ethereum itself. And the kind of problem I see with that is you could, you, you see all these... Uh, layer twos uh, becoming their own kind of ecosystem. And because you kind of get the fragmentation of the, the Ethereum ecosystem into these smaller ecosystem, which which once again are isolated due to the fact that if you want to bridge from one ecosystem to another, you kind of get a, a, a delay in between there. You kind of get a fragmentation of the entire ETH ecosystem, which I perceive as a, as a negative, as a net negative, right? So how do you see this kind of fragmentation of the Ethereum ecosystem developing over time? Yeah, so I, well, first of all, it's a, it's a great point. And it's certainly something that I think a lot of people have been worried about for a while, but I think they've been overly worried, and I'll explain why. Um, so, if, so the first thing to be said is, um, the, what are the layer two is going to look like? These are basically uh, computers with different virtual machines, different instruction sets. It's like your old x86, 64 architecture or whatever, you know. I, these different hardware companies printed loads of different types of computer. Obviously, these computers are much, much. Once you've delivered them, they're much cheaper to kind of. I can I can spin up kind of L3s or you know sort of basically de- decentralized computers on top of these things, and they're basically free to print. Um, the fragmentation question is a great one, but I would say I don't know whether you've, there's, there's some piece of research that's come out from Geometry recently called Slush. Uh, there's also a thing called a Fossil built by Marcello Bardas. Uh, at, uh, at he was at uh, Euler um, slash um, uh, yeah maybe he uh, just slash another mind and uh, building uh, state proofs and what this means basically is you can make uh, uh, statements proofs about things going on in other layer two networks and you don't need to build sort of trustful bridges between those networks and so. You can do things like, and obviously this is all going to have to happen, by the way, obscured from the user. I don't, users are not going to want to deal with the faff of, oh, I've got some capital on optimism. I've got some, I've got some money on, you know, Starknet. The users are just not going to want to do that. This is all got to run in the background. But basically, uh, this massively reduces the complication of taking some capital out of one layer one. Let's suppose it's like a sort of some 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 a die or something. I don't know what it is. Out of one layer two, sorry. And uh, kind of essentially locking it on that layer two and using it in some destination layer two without any additional trust assumptions except for the security assumptions you're making around the security of the layer one where you currently live, where the asset has has been created and where it is being used, where it's being bridged to. So I, I, I think once those capital bridges are formed, I think then obviously the wallet has got some peddling to do because it's got to make sure that you can sort of swiftly and virtually instantly bridge assets across these these various L2s. But given that you can now do so with essentially no additional security assumptions, I'm really not sure that the balkanization is going to be as bad as people think it is. Uh, 
so basically what you're describing is <clears throat> in layman's terms it's like a layer three and this layer three is able to to uh kind of communicate and bridge the layer twos and all the apps built on the layer three are able to kind of use the individual layer twos for their for their nft or their transaction logic or whatever you want to work with yeah I, I would i would say that this this kind of inter interchain protocol is not it's not really less mm -hmm. it's more like a sort of it's it's uh, th these are two cousin chains. They're both sitting underneath Ethereum layer one, and the point is that on one chain I can sort of make some sort of provable statement about what's going on on another chain, assuming that I believe its security assumptions. And 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 by the way, largely I'm making this proof. Actually, I say assuming <laughs> Ethereum has already has. If you think about it, right at the top, Ethereum is just saying yes to all of these rollups. So there comes some point at which Ethereum is the last and final word on every transaction that's ever happened in all these layer twos. And really what you're doing is you're appeal appealing to what's on Ethereum mainnet to just say, can you just check what you actually approve from that from that cousin layer two? And so that these are probably not protocols, by the way, that capture any value. So these cross-chain proofs, precisely because they're not increasing the, the, the security assumptions, there's no extra attestation to make. There's no one who needs to stake any money in to underwrite the bridge anymore because I can just know that this thing is true, um, assuming I trust Ethereum layer one. So, and then what I meant by layer threes is these are much more like kind of PPPs. So this is kind of you know, lower layers of technology. They need their own execution environment for some reason. They probably need lower levels of data availability guarantee or they need sort of particular finality times for the particular use case that they require. That's probably the closest successor to the PC. It's like a decentralized PC. Um, and and that's what I would sort of describe as a layer three. It's also possible, by the way, to talk about, you know, some, a company like Aztec. They're currently a layer two, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't see anything that could stop them from becoming also a layer three at the same time and producing a layer of privacy to other layer twos. And maybe that's how, also how we'll talk about, about, about layer threes. But I think that language currently is not very clear. Um, if if you were to recommend some sources for reading or or, or watching or what, what, on this topic specifically, is there anything you could recommend for me to dig into? Um, hmm. So there was, if you look up the words um, volition and validium, there were some quite interesting discussions around data availability. Do you, do I, to, be honest, to be honest, this is something that geometry should be writing. So um, if I, if you, if you give me your if we sort of exchange details after the call, I'd, I'd, I'd actually love to use you as a, if you're happy to, as a sort of a, a reader for such materials, I'm, I'm, I'd be very happy to write them because this is stuff, is literature that needs to get out there. I think it's understood by people who have worked at Layer 2, but it's, there's a lot of jargon here and I do understand it's quite impenetrable. Um, and so I'd be really happy to, to work on that project with actually anyone in the room who wants to act as a as a as a kind of as a checker on 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 that kind of material um to see whether it kind of passes the the, the test of whether it's understandable so uh yeah please do get in touch if, if you'd like to be a be a proofreader on that sort of thing absolutely i'll i'll reach out to you thank you that, that's great I'm, I'm happy to connect you guys as well um so uh, thanks, awesome. yeah no, thanks very much tom um great um if there's any other questions from the from the room please feel free to uh to request a speaking slot um if not probably a good time to, to wrap it up and uh, really Tom this has been fascinating obviously we're talking about the the intersection between um, as you said NFTs DeFi metaverse and everything happening and you're sort of seeing all of that so really appreciate it really appreciate your insights uh, always great to catch up and, and hear what you're what you're up to um, for people in the room thank you for having for being here and, and listening in obviously um, if you're not on our discord yet please feel free to uh, to join us we're always keeping people up to date on the things we're doing we're working on a couple of very exciting updates ourselves within capture and the uh frck nfts uh so feel free to um, to check out our um, our discord or our twitter and, and go from there um and again thank you all um, we'll wrap it up here and we'll be back soon with another interesting speaker